Now, I'll ask another round of questions, but uh, then we will take uh, questions from the audience. There'll be a couple of roving mics going around, I think one on, on either side of the hall, so try and, and get their attention, but I'm sure you've got lots of questions for the panellists. Uh, Kaoru, can I just ask you one personal question? What is your favourite race, the uh, Arima Keenan or the Derby? <laughs> Uh, it's quite hard to say that the yeah, derby is uh, uh, just, you know, that yeah, for the three years old horse race and uh, uh, Japanese derby is uh, like a uh, uh, festival or race in, uh, throughout the year. Ali Makinez, I've already mentioned uh, before that the Ali Makinez race for, uh, you know, that it's uh, uh, will be held, uh, is held on uh, end of December. Well, the New Year's Day um, in January is quite a uh, very, very important uh, uh, day uh, for the Japanese people. So people like to know their lucks next year and bet on the, uh, their favorite horses. Uh, that is uh, Ali Makinen. So the uh, turnover is uh, much more than the derby. The Ali Makinen turnover is much more than the derby. Right, thank you. Um, Claire, I said I would come back to this, and, and uh, over the last few years you've had Elton John, Carlos Santana, Jennifer Lopez uh, performing at, um, at, at these events. How important is the post-race entertainment in Dubai? Um, since we've launched Made Daniel you right, we've taken the entertainment to a different level than we had at Nadal Shiva Race Course. Um, I really believe it's, it's quite important now. The audience demands entertainment, excitement. Um, it's actually, in my opinion, the success of a big event. It's marrying the sport, a strong sport, with entertainment. Um, putting them together makes a big event. Um, and we, every year, we put on another big act for the crowds, and it's been very well received. And it's reflected in our, in our attendance, it's reflected in the attention that we get for the events. And benchmarking against um, our associates around the world obviously is very important, but benchmarking locally against the other events is also very important. And we're competing against some strong events um, in the UAE. We have Formula One, we have um, the Desert Classic Golf, we have the Dubai Tennis Championships. And we really need to keep the Dubai World Cup at a level that attracts the customer base to us throughout the year. Now, Brian, the importance of the timing of a main event for television. In yeah. Ireland, you had 66,000 watched RTE's broadcast of the Irish Derby in 2011, and it was staged in the mid-afternoon. And then in 2012, the race had run in the early evening, and the audience was 175,000, peaking at 225,000. That's pretty much a no-brainer, isn't it, in terms of scheduling? Yeah, uh, and that's happened for a number of our race meetings. We've, we've moved uh, our race meetings into uh, more TV-friendly slots. As you say, we increased the, the overall viewership for the Derby by fourfold. So for Irish Champions Weekend, we will run the, the feature race on the Saturday, uh, 5.30 uh, uh, start, uh, primetime television. Uh, it also helps the attendance as well. People say to us now, you know, rather than a, a, an early afternoon start, they're able to do something in the morning and then come to the races. So we've generally moved all our, our major race times uh, towards uh, more primetime television slots, um, and that has worked very well for us. And why over two days, two race courses? Uh, I suppose it's, it's, it's a bit like Rod in Britain. Uh, I think, you know, the, 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 there's a degree of politics involved in it. There's a degree of practicality. Uh, you know, the sprint track in, in the Curra is... is uh, it, it, the Leperson doesn't have a straight sprint track, so uh, in order to run sprints, you need to run at the Curra. And I think it's also to showcase, you know, two of our great tracks. It's not really any different, in my view, than us coming to Hong Kong here this week and seeing Sha Tin one day, Happy Valley the next day. I think it's an opportunity for visitors to the country to come see Leopardstown on the Saturday, uh, you know, come look at the, the, the stud farms, the training centres in the Curra on the Sunday morning, and then go see the Curra in the afternoon. Rod, what's your experience on, on, on that, using the, the, the two tracks? Uh, 
with, with uh, you mean with regard to the the, the new market yeah. and the uh, yeah, yeah again I think it's driven by the fixture list and our own our, our own parochial issues. But um, again, in relative terms, compared to some of the other nations we're talking about, we're a small country, so the distance between the two tracks is mm. not an issue. And we, we think it works well. There'll be six Group 1s over a, a 48-hour period. Um, both are broadcast on, on television, and we're able to celebrate the, the future on one day with our Future Champions Day, which is all based upon the, the two-year-olds at, at Newmarket, very naturally leading into the, the three-year-olds and the older horses on our, our Champions Day. So we, we think it works well from a a promotional point of view and from a logistical point of view, it's relatively straightforward. And Craig, in the United States, deciding where to race is an important decision to take. Well, we're fortunate that uh, we've had a lot of tracks to choose from over the years. As you know, the Breeders' Cup started in 1984 at Hollywood Park. I think uh, when Mr. Gaines and the founders of the Breeders' Cup were deciding where they would go, the general presumption was that the event would be run in New York. In fact, the New York Racing Association uh, felt that they were the natural place for the Breeders' Cup to be run because many of their races at that time were the natural year-ending races in the United States. But uh, Marge Everett, who was then the president of the Breeders' Cup, uh, threw a, a, a lot of money at the Breeders' Cup, built a $40 million Cary Grant pavilion and promised that they would have celebrities like Cary Grant and Elizabeth Taylor and, and others at the Breeders' Cup. And I think that kicked off uh, a, a real interesting pattern of how the Breeders' Cup has decided where to go over the years. And certainly, we've been in California for the last two years and we'll be back there again this year. And uh, the Hollywood part of that is a, a major attraction and uh, not to mention the weather. Yeah. Now, Michael, you hinted that you're already and naturally you would. You look at, um, at the first uh, running of the championships and see what you can learn from that. But are you suggesting that you might, in fact, you've learned enough already to make adjustments for next year? There's certainly a, a fair bit of criteria there to digest now. And certainly for us, one of the key issues is to make the championships week or the bookend of the two Saturdays, making it a destination week. That's for the purpose of getting support from the New South Wales government, who have been very supportive, obviously, over the past few years. And um, in concert with that, there's the major international yearling sales that uh, happens uh, around Easter time. And if we could position that closer to the championships in between the championship race days, that would certainly um, provide us with that destination week. You mentioned that you've had the support of the New South Wales government, and you have, but of course you've got a new Premier now. Uh, quite unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that will make any difference in terms of the level of support that you're getting? Look, I think you have to deal with who's in front of you at the time and um, who would have thought you know, a few years back that encouraging the two major race clubs to merge uh, when they did um, with the compelling reason of a, you know, a major injection of funding, $174 million to, to build Racecourse 2.0. You know, Royal Randwick has now uh, providing that infrastructure to allow us to put on a show such as the, the championships or the carnival in general. So, you know, I think we just need to get in front of government, explain to them how important racing is to them as a sport. Uh, the wagering is important to them. Tourism, tourism is important to them. So I think that would be convincing enough reasons. Yeah. Uh, Simon, I'm sure most people in this room understand how tough it can be in Singapore uh, because of the, the, the regulations and not being able to advertise and I don't think they, the newspapers publish form guides. How, how, do you, how do you build awareness of an event without that? Well, the Singapore Gold Cup was uh, marketed since uh, 1995. As a charity race day, we uh, invite over 400 charitable organisations over the years uh, since 95 and give up some over 21 million, as you see in the video. Um, by engaging this uh, from the charitable angle, it's, it gives us an avenue to reach out to the public. And one of the, um, or the guests of honour for that event is always the uh, President of the Republic of Singapore. So he's the head of state and uh, we have Prime Minister who came for the event. So by using avenues like that, we, we could uh, better market the event. Uh, we also show the race live on the free-to-air channel. I think you can get that channel here. On, uh, it's Channel News Asia. And that race is actually live. One of the few races that we could show live uh, to the general public. So we, we use an opportunity like that to, to better market the race. 
uh, and also to let people know the good work that the club is doing over the years. Mm. Um, so that, that's something that we, we will have to continue to do. Yeah. Have we got questions from the audience ready to go? We, there's one here. Three rows from the front. That's the one. Thank you, Louis Romanet, chairman of IFHA. Uh, as the Prix de l'Art de Triomphe didn't look like to be considered as a big event today, I just want to remind you that uh, uh, last year in the world ranking list, uh, it was classified as the number one race. And one information uh, for the audience is that uh, this year the prize money has been boosted to 5 million euros, which will uh, confirm its place as the number one race on turf. And on the same day, uh, we will have uh, the uh, richest race for Arabian horses of one million, and we only have seven Group 1 races on that day. Anybody like to comment on what Louis just had to say? <laughs> Rod? I, think, um, I think it demonstrates one thing, that competition is a wonderful thing. Mm. And that if you're an owner now of premium bloodstock, you have choice worldwide in relation to where you can run your horses and, and competition is always good and that extends to horse racing because it has a setting the bar higher and here you have lots of nations promoting their, their very very best another leading nation quite rightly feeling the need to remind us of their very important status so if you're in the bloodstock game if you're an owner this is a, a fantastic time to be in horse racing very diplomatic any another one I'm Vivek Jain from India. The question is that most of the videos and talks focused on one big event in each country, whether it's the Melbourne Cup, the ARC, or the Dubai World Cup. How do you sustain interest and promote the game across the racing season and not just one big event? That's a good question. And also, we shouldn't forget regional and country racing as well, which is absolutely the lifeblood of, uh, of racing, certainly in Australia. It's, it's where people first take up an interest in the sport in many cases. Yeah, and that's true. What, what you say is correct. Um, yeah, the interest in, in racing in Australia is, is almost a hobby. Um, Australians love to gamble. We're, we're not a, a huge population, but um, certainly our, our wagering dollar is up there with the very best of them. So we don't have any problem keeping them interested in racing day in, day out, uh, but certainly uh, the concept of having, uh, you know, the grand finals, the championship events, the social event of the year, uh, to bring focus upon your city, your state, your country, um, and, and the sport of racing in general is something that, you know, you can't do it 365 days a year, so you have to pick the best time for racing in your country. And for us in New South Wales, it's in the autumn, and compliments to Victoria, the, the, the best time is in the spring. And Martin, in, in, in Dubai, how would you respond to that sort of a question? Do you just have the big race days or can you say you have a, a very broad reach of carnivals? No, I mean, um, in, it's not just racing in, in Dubai. There's, there's, there's other Emirates that have it as well and there's other race courses in Dubai, Jebel Ali, and we've got Abu Dhabi, Sharjah, LA. Um, from the World Cup, the World Cup, as you know, was established in 1996 and then as an extension of that, in 2004, we extended the international side of it to the Dubai International Racing Carnival and now the Dubai World Cup Carnival. So um, it has built up not just a presence in, in the UAE, but also internationally by getting horses that wouldn't normally have traveled 15 years ago because they were international races were primarily for group one horses. Now we're getting horses that are sort of your 90 rated horses, your listed rated horses coming from different parts of the world. So we're getting promotion, promotion and awareness for those three months of the year outside of the UAE. Now inside of the UAE, Jebel Ali race course is, is fantastic crowds every Friday. There's free admission, there's giveaways. So that there's, and the, the media races are shown on Dubai Racing Channel that there's a a dedicated racing publication that there's racing in the newspapers all the time so the the promotion and the awareness of it is 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 quite strong yep mm -hmm. 
that's quite happy because uh, uh, after the uh, derby, uh, the winner or second or third runners of the uh, uh, Japanese derby will be get uh, will can get the uh, uh, most popularity from the racing fund and the horses uh, will be running in Arimaki at the end of the year. Yeah. So we we have two peaks. We're very happy. The twin peaks. The twin peaks. Yeah, very, uh, I just want to mention, uh, you know, that's a very good question, something we all struggle with, how to maintain relevance throughout the year sometimes. As we know, uh, particularly in the United States, horses' careers don't tend to extend over three- and four-year periods like they do here in Hong Kong, where people have a, a rooting interest in particular animals for the most part. But uh, one thing we've been very successful with, as I mentioned earlier in our new TV series and our challenge series, uh, is definitely drawn the attention of not only the public, but the horse racing world in terms of qualifying races for the Breeders' Cup. I, I note that uh, on the new Irish Champions Day, there'll be four Breeders' Cup win in your in races. We've had great success working with our friends in Ireland to extend our brand and to make sure that the Irish horsemen know that the hospitality of the Breeders' Cup's extended to them when they perform well at their own home venues. Right. I think that's, that's, that's a point. It strikes me that most of the meetings we're talking about here are end of season ch championships, finales, mm -hmm. uh, and I think you know, a number of the speakers spoke about the, the lead up to those finales and creating a sequence of races into that, and I think that's what uh, part of our thinking in, in Europe is as well. Louis mentions the arc. I mean, you now have three major end of season meetings in Europe with 18 Group 1 opportunities within five weeks of each other. Uh, you know, that's a fantastic launching pad for European horses uh, to compete uh, uh, in Europe before going on to the major international events. And I, I think uh, in time, even more than is the case at present, these major events will link more and more to each other. You know, a circuit is starting to evolve and certainly it was a driving factor in our thinking that, you know, Ireland has good success, great success internationally with our horses, but we didn't have an event at home to compare with the meetings that Irish horses and trainers were competing in internationally. Rod? It was, it was indeed a, a, a very good question, and I think for, for us in Britain, storyline is, is key, and hence the creation of the British Champion Series. So we have our finale day on, on Kipco British Champions Day, but we have lead-ups, and all of our consumer research we did told us that what people are interested in, when we're talking about sport in general, is who's the best, whether we're talking about tennis, grand slams, or golf, or soccer. Um, and that, that's true of racing. And what we've tried to do is highlight the best moments in the calendar over the flat season to encourage the public in occasionally to look at the best. Because you're, 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 the, the wider public can't cope in the UK with 1,400 fixtures and racing 362 days a year. That's for our, our aficionado base, for our betting base, which is still very important. Mm -hmm but looking to grow the popularity of the sport and get more people involved and to drive more commercial interest, you have to have a broader approach, and we think it's by having a really good storyline. Now, there was a question, and it, uh, it's gone from the screen. I think it, it went to the Super Series, though, didn't it? And can we get that question back on the, uh, the, uh, the World Series? Can the World Series in, in the early 21st century be revamped through cooperation from top racing jurisdictions? This will surely capture the imagination of racing fans on a continuous basis. Brian, what do you say to that? Yeah, well, it goes to the point I just made, Barry, that I think, you know, in, in the first instance, we're linking or, or looking to link the three European meetings into a series uh, that you can have opportunities uh, for horses to compete in each of the three countries. Um, as many people in the room will know, there, were, there was a World Series uh, with the support of Emirates uh, uh, tried six or seven years ago, uh, maybe more than that now, uh, and it failed on the issue of media rights uh, and uh, ownership of, of pictures, uh, and uh, it ran its course in, 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 uh, um, because of that. Uh, I think it will evolve again. I think what we're seeing is it's already informally evolving. Uh, these meetings are, as Craig said, linking with each other informally, and that may lead to a more formal link. Um, you have to remember that horses aren't motor cars. We can't create a Formula One circuit, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the same way as they do in, in, in motor racing, um, where the same horses turn up, you know, every three weeks in, in, in one of the great cities of the world. But I, I think more and more these major meetings will link up, and certainly that's one of our priorities in Europe is to link, uh, you know, Ireland, France, uh, and, and the UK uh, uh, with our three meetings. Yeah. Rod? Instinctively, it feels right. There'll be 
all sorts of challenges, but we, I think we can tell through the use of social media um, in Great Britain how popular international races are. And you can see people getting up at ungodly hours in the morning to watch races from, for, uh, for, from overseas or equally staying up very late at night to watch them, which leads me to think if we're, if we're developing any World Series concept, it's likely to be initially aficionado-led. I think we've all got big challenges in our own territories to promote to the wider public and get them interested in racing first before we start to present to them the world scene. So my guess would be if we were doing something on a world basis, our initial market would be the aficionado. But I know from my own experience, there are plenty of aficionados out there who take a big interest in what's taking place internationally. And Martin, uh, Dubai would want a share of the action, wouldn't they? Well, as, as Brian said, it, <coughs> it was tried before with the, the Emirates World Series. Um, the, key, the key issues to it is, first of all, what distance are you going to have these races over? Is it the, like the Emirates World Series was from, from 2,000 metres or a mile and a quarter to a mile and a half? Now, that ruled out all the sprinters. Um, what surface do you have it on? I mean, if you have it on turf, then that rules out the very best horses in America. Um, and then, of course, you've got to have a really concise view about the quarantine restrictions all around the world. It's, it's, it's a good idea and it's a great idea in, in theory, but there's a lot of hurdles that need to be, to be overcome insofar as quarantine, you know, is there a Phillies and Mares series? Is there a three-year-old series? Is there, um, you know, what, what distance do we have these races over and what surface? Mm. Just before we go on uh, to other questions from the audience, I want to raise sponsorship now. And Bill, um, in, in Hong Kong, of course, you've had uh, Cathay Pacific now complemented by Long, uh, by long Jeans. Um, it's, so you're doing well, but, but how, how difficult is it to, to, uh, to still bring in these major iconic sponsors? Well, Cath Cathay Pacific was a good sponsor for the Hong Kong International Races for, for quite a period of time. But, but in the last two years, we've had long jeans replace them. And in Hong Kong, we, we tend to have only one sponsor uh, for a race meeting. So they have exclusivity on the day. And uh, long jeans, I think, has been a, a terrific sponsor. It's embraced horse racing internationally as well as equestrian. And um, they're a natural for us in that in the Asian market, uh, particularly, timepieces are really sought after. And it's a, it's a real luxury market. And as a great sponsor of horse racing, this event, I think, makes sense for them. It makes sense for us. And we can collaborate together on, on marketing efforts and promotion of, of the day. And when you look at a day like the Hong Kong International Races and, and where it's come, you know, a sponsor is one piece of it. But there's just so much that goes into it. We, you know, prize money, of course, is a big thing for us, as well as travel and hospitality allowances and packages that we have for horses and owners and trainers and jockeys, and really getting everything right, the people and the, the skill sets of those people to make sure that the end-to-end -end experience is right from when the horse arrives into quarantine, uh, the training facilities, every little detail that really makes a big day uh, succeed, uh, not just for the day, but for the whole week uh, leading up. So the sponsor is, is one piece of it, but when you really look at the total the total package of what you'd need to deliver an event like this. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a big undertaking, and um, you really have to make sure that you get every detail right so that you can win the approval of uh, the stakeholders that will come back in, in year, year on year, that the, you know, the entertainment and the experience really equals excellence. Craig, what's the experience in the United States? Is it getting easier or harder to draw the sponsors in? Well, I think, you know, culturally speaking, uh, I think the United States may be a little different than a lot of other countries because gambling over the years has not had quite the same social acceptance as, as it has in some other countries. And, and as a result of that, you know, I uh, used to work at the racetrack in Del Mar, and we were uh, as successful as anyone in generating sponsorship money, but it was still a challenge because a lot of major businesses had just historical aversion to gambling interests. And, uh, certainly the, the economic situation of 2008 didn't help. A lot of sponsorship deals that were in existence in those days were rolled off. Uh, even com even uh, 
uh, organizations like NASCAR that have had you know, tremendous sponsorship support from auto companies and others had, had found themselves struggling to retain sponsors at particularly at former levels. And so we've had struggles along those lines too. I think we have some uh, indications in recent months that uh, we're going to turn the corner on that and be able to generate some new ones. And uh, I'm actually thinking about buying a watch while I'm here in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> we'd be interested in having a few watches to wear around ourselves. And Michael, in Australia, that's true, isn't it? That there's no stigma associated to racing uh, in, in perhaps the way it might be in some other countries. And, and it's, not, it's certainly not an obstacle in terms of the sponsors wanting to identify with big events. No, that's right. And um, for us, for many years, the, the sponsors came from an industry base. And when you, you get new entrants such for, in Australia, for, such as Longines, and, um, you know, and you've got corporates like BMW, our exposure to the corporate marketplace, certainly the championships has opened the door for them. Uh, we've got so many new corporates attending the racetrack just through this last um, carnival. And um, it, it's, it's, good, it's good to be able to broaden your exposure to the consumer market. Um, our, Obviously our uh, intent is to data mine a lot more than we have in the past and um, initiatives such as the Little Sydney uh, hospitality area where we, um, we had 750 different, uh, on two separate days, 750 um, attendees enjoying the eating, the drinking, the gambling, whatever, or the wagering. And, um, but that was a completely new uh, list of, of uh, attendees. Uh, so it's, it's for us, the industry needs to ensure, or Sydney Racing uh, needs to ensure that we continue to open the door to, to the sport, to the, to the attendees, the spectators as well. And Claire, it's the area that you, of course, specialise in. Uh, what, what's your experience? I actually think that the, the world of sponsorship is growing for us as a, as a sport. Um, so many more companies around the world are understanding the benefit of connecting to their customer database through sports sponsorship and um, so that's absolutely in our favor um, and the development of sponsorship is is key to us we don't have wagering we don't have that um, income coming in so we we do focus heavily on sponsorship and we've done a big restructure over the last four years probably in creating partnerships with some key big companies and similar to Bill we don't sell by the race, we sell exclusively by the meeting. And in fact, we've packaged that into a broader package, um, which we've created as our pillar partner program, um, whereby we don't actually hand over our key asset base, which is our Dubai Rail Cup races. We package it into the whole season so that we're actually securing um, partners through the year rather than just for a one hit wonder on our, on our key race day. Um, and by doing that, we've actually um, developed our promotional strategy through that as well. So we work with her key partners like Emirates Airline, a huge reach, you know, so we, we talk to their database as well. Uh, Longine, we've all mentioned Longine several times through this conference, but I mean, they're, they're a huge supporter of, of, of racing, of equestrianism um, throughout the world. And using them to connect to further customers, like was mentioned, it's, it's Fantastic. It's a great way to get additional business of additional revenue. And it's not an issue in Japan, at least not for the moment. <laughs> uh, it's uh, honestly speaking, the sponsorship in, in Japan and the situation is uh, quite different from other countries. No, uh, actually, we don't have uh, uh, any sponsors in Japan. Uh, don't ask why. <laughs> uh, but at this stage, uh, we don't uh, think that the, uh, to introduce a major sponsor to the uh, big races in Japan, but uh, in, the, in the future, um, I'm not quite sure that it's uh, uh, five years ago, uh, uh, later, 10 years in term, um, that I'm not quite sure about that. Mm. Another question? Just wait for the microphone. There we go. Uh, Greg Nichols, Racing Victoria. Uh, a question directed to Rod. 
sorry to put you on notice, old mate, but uh, it's intriguing to me uh, that there's an inconsistency that can be equally applied to a number of other uh, uh, champion-defining race days uh, throughout the world. But the inconsistency that um, I was curious to uh, note was the introduction of Europe's richest mile handicap on Champions Day, when the principle of Champions Day should be about defining the champions on equal terms rather than uh, the handicap terms. So what was the logic behind your uh, organisation in introducing a race such as uh, whatever it's going to be called, but Europe's richest mile handicap? It's a good question, Greg. Um, I think we have to recognise our own marketplace. Uh, and in addition to wanting to promote the best racing in the world and to compete on a, on a worldwide level with our racing. Britain um, is a nation of punters, and despite not having the, the, the wonderful betting model that we have here in, in Hong Kong, it remains very important to us. So having a, a, a very engaging handicap is good for us. And if you look across Britain's other big race meetings, if you look at the Royal Meeting, for example, at Royal Ascot, they managed to integrate superb Group 1 championship races with handicaps and with the punting audience, with the TV audience, it's often the big handicaps that have the, the best turnover, whether you're talking about the Royal Hunt Cup or the, or the Wokingham. So we felt there was place for it. Um, we think it's another way to engage an audience as well. Um, punters love big handicaps. The broadcaster likes it. And, and notably, in bringing in this, this quarter of a million pound handicap, um, Channel 4, our, our national broadcaster, have granted an extra half an hour's um, viewing on the day. So they've, they've extended the program, which is great for us. It's another half hour advert for the sport. So we think it, it sits very nicely in it. And, and yes, probably unusual with one or two other racing setups. But I think in relation to the British setup, there is always room for good competitive handicaps for our punters. Uh, Barry, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think the other point I would, I would make on that is that uh, certainly in Ireland, I'm not sure it was the case in, in the UK, there's, there's a small group of trainers and owners and jockeys that would have horses to compete at champ championship level. So we've put two high-value handicaps on each of our days with a view to encouraging participation in the day, uh, involvement in the day from all our trainers and our, our owners and, and our riders. So I think it's a, a case of striking a balance across the day. Um, Michael, just getting back um, to your event, the championships, and um, they drew two international horses. They, they both actually won races through that period, as it turns out, but clearly quarantine. Quarantining is a problem if, if they have to be in quarantine about a thousand kilometres away at Werribee. Um, is there an answer to that? Are you making progress? Yeah, there, there certainly is an answer to that. Um, we, um, because the... Um, the green tick from the government wasn't received until late in 2013. We certainly got caught a little short on uh, quarantine arrangements, but thankfully our southern uh, neighbours uh, in Werribee uh, were able to accommodate us, and as quarantine is a challenge to have it so far away. But the um, Racing New South Wales as the regulator is certainly looking much, much closer to home. Uh, it'll be probably close to one of the uh, provincial tracks and uh, should resolve quarantine in the future. Right. And will that be expensive and who pays? Well, <clears throat> we only had the two runners internationally um, this year and there was a couple of little deals made that one for one and not the other. But at the end of the day, the success is that they both scored Group 1 wins out, uh, outside the championship days, uh, albeit. But, um, I, I, a lot of the business model certainly needs to be um, put into, into a better practice scenario, a better policy as to how, how we address that in total for the future. Anywhere else is, is quarantining of the horses a frustration? Is it a, is it a real issue? Is it a drawback on the international of the racing, I mean, in terms of getting the horses around the world? It seems that Australia's always had this uh, unique problem, I think. Um, then we're, we're just so far away. Um, can we talk now about, unless there are there other questions from the audience, I want to get on to race surfaces, but there's one in the front row. 
Another one here. I'll get uh, hi, good morning. I'm Mohit Lalwani. My question is with the number of new events being instituted, and obviously these will be aggressively promoted, is there a risk that some of the more traditional and important races will begin to lose relevance and we become very heavy on top as against having a pyramid structure that we've had for so many years? Who would like to take that? Well, certainly in our case, these are not new races. Uh, they're races that are already exist within the pyramid. It's the same in the UK uh, with Britain's races. It, it, it's just been a case of rejigging and repackaging them in, into one meeting. So and I think that's, that's my understanding of the situation in Europe and across the rest of the world. I'm not sure that any of us sitting here have created new events. I think we've developed existing races and packaged them differently and promoted them differently. And Right in the front here. That's it, Barry. Hi, uh, Simon Burgess from Australia from the media. Um, been a lot of talk this week about engaging the customer and getting more people to the events. And looking at these videos, anyone would want to go to, anyone would have all these events on their racing bucket list, I'm sure. In the spirit of what the conference is all about, should there be more collaborative marketing as a group to promote these events to an audience? and? I understand what Martin's saying about it being difficult for the horses to be able to keep coming up all the time, but looking at the audience and the, the customer, if you like, do you think there should be some more collaborative marketing to promote these events across, you know, a global sort to a global audience? And how would that work, Craig? Yeah, Barry, if you don't mind, uh, I, I would say that that has already started in, in large part. I think you have to recognize, first of all, that you know we're sitting here with two events that have two years under their belt and, and one that's just starting up this year. Uh, the Breeders' Cup has been fortunate that, that we've had great relationships over the years with racing authorities and racing entities in other countries that cross-promote our product. Uh, you know, we've had great success working with the French uh, when Goldacova was running and the Breeders' Cup races that she won. Uh, there was tremendous interest in France and tremendous publication by both the PMU and France Gallo to help uh, promote her participation in the Breeders' Cup. So I, I think it's been more informal than formal. Uh, I think there's tremendous opportunity for us to do that because if you look at the videotape from the Breeders' Cup, you see horses that ran at the British Champions Day at the ARC meeting. Um, and, and there's so much more continuity now than there ever has been that the opportunities are great. I, I think we're all opportunities like this to get together and, and recognize the chance to do this is important. And, and we've, as I said, we've already started doing that, but I think we can be a lot better at it. Mm. Anyone else? Rod? Um, notably this year, I think you've picked up a really interesting theme here. Um, France, Ireland and, and Britain have met on a quarterly basis to discuss a more collaborative approach to marketing and their key, the key commercial people from each team has met to talk about how we can work together to promote initially the European finale to the, to the flat season, but there's no reason why that can't be extended. And, and I think equally you know, get-togethers like this are, are, are fascinating where we can learn how other nations are doing things and we can we can pick up what's transferable. Obviously, there are, there are things that are unique to destinations that you can't take from another place because it's what they're all about. But there are lots and lots of um, marketing initiatives and, and, and lots and lots of consumer-facing initiatives that I think we can learn from. So collaboration has to be a very sensible way forward. And Michael, the concept, the Australasia concept, I mean, Australia and New Zealand do work fairly closely together, but is, is there opportunities to do more? Well, the world is getting smaller. Certainly with the, the technology that, that around, I mean, we, we know um, where events are, we know where the racing calendars, how they fit. Um, you know, we, we didn't do much for our carnival to change our programming. We tweaked it a, a, a little bit. But at the end of the day, you're dealing with uh, an athlete, uh, a horse that um, decides to, to run over a period of time and you can't run around a full circuit around the world. But there's choice, and that choice is driven by owners and trainers, the participants, to be able to, to pick and choose which events they actually can deal with globally. So they're not going to be able to do all of them, but they can certainly do a circuit of some sort. And I think as um, race clubs and jurisdictions, we should be encouraging um, that kind of movement to, to be able to make 
uh, competition a lot more international. I mean, for us, the, the championships wasn't always about just having an international horse being a non-Australian New Zealand horse. Um, we certainly would love to see some of our events won by an American, a European, a Japanese, um, Hong Kong, wherever they come from. But for us, our, our greatest competitor in this carnival time was actually the New Zealand horses who, who took three out of four of the major races. And that's, that's, that's positive for the sport. Mm. Certainly I'm in Melbourne, but the Australian racing would like to see the Japanese horses mm. back again, right? Because clearly it's accepted that they set a very high standard and the interest level is, is enormous when they're there. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the carnival just gone by, uh, I think, demonstrated very clearly that um, not so much that racing's a, a level playing field, but you can move from one jurisdiction to the other. And, you know, there's only very small differences in abilities of horses, and they, they can be very competitive, not only on their own turf, but um, on someone else's turf. Bill? Yeah, I think in Hong Kong, <clears throat> what we've had here is, um, from a marketing standpoint, we had to really drive home in our own market to build the interest because of the point you, the question you asked at the beginning about you know, uh, turnover and the level of interest in Hong Kong and international races. And we've seen it really evolve in the last five years where on course attendance used to be, if we were lucky, 50,000. Now we're at 70,000 and now we're at the point um, where I think Craig's point is, is right. It's more informal than formal, but with so many horses now traveling from overseas um, that we're getting more tourists coming in more Hong Kong international races in Hong Kong as a destination point, and also more interest because some of the, the big name horses are coming from other parts of the world. Certainly when a top Japanese horse comes, the level of media interest and the number of people that travel is quite considerable. And we're seeing that uh, to lesser uh, effect with, with, with horses from other countries. But now we're at the point where we're almost uh, at the max. I mean, in terms of quality space uh, for people to really enjoy the day, uh, at 70,000, that, that's pretty much the limit. But it's, it's been a great experience over the last five years to see how our marketing efforts have paid off, not, not just in attracting more people from overseas who are following their horses in the spirit of international competition and, and pride, but also in the growth of interest right here in Hong Kong. Uh, just Barry, to the question, I mean, um, this week our marketing team are in Chester uh, in the UK uh, and next week we'll be in York with Rod's assistance uh, promoting uh, the meeting. But what, what is happening at that forum that Rod referred to, which is uh, unique in my experience, Chester and York are exchanging their, their data, their mailing lists, their members lists to us and we're doing the opposite. We're promoting it very much to their membership. In the past, I think clubs have had a reluctance to share that data, share that information. So. Uh, you know, we see one of our biggest target markets for Irish Champions Weekend being the members of British racecourses. Uh, and it's been fantastic to see the level of cooperation that has emerged at that level, uh, you know, which, which is tangible in terms of putting, putting feet on the ground. Now, I want to raise the issue now of track services, um, turf versus dirt versus synthetic. Um, in Dubai now, the, the, there is an issue, isn't there, about, um, about replacing um, the, the track uh, with Dirt Martin, and is that the strategy behind that to try and draw up more runners from America? I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to, to call it an issue. I mean, it was, it was unfortunate that this year we didn't get a runner from America in the, in the World Cup. Um, but against that, we had the English Derby winner, we had the Japan Cup, Cup Dirt winner, we had the Hong Kong International Cup winner and the Singapore International Cup winner. We had eight Group One winners in it. Um, so I, I, it was it was disappointing the fact that you know there, w there wasn't more concentration on the horses that, that were there rather than the horses that weren't. Um, you're right. There was you know talk about you know possibly replacing um, the tapita with the dirt surface. Um, the question before about having a World Series. Do you, would you get those turf horses running on the dirt? And vice versa, would you get dirt horses running on the turf? There, there's another. But look, it's going to be a situation where our board will sit down, they'll, they'll go through it, they'll discuss it with Sheikh Mohammed, and if there's, if there's going to be a change, then they'll, they'll announce something later on. But, um, you know, at the moment, it's just, it was mainly um, 
reports in the media saying building up the fact that we didn't have a, a, an American horse. Craig, what is the experience in the United States now? Is there a trend in one direction? Are you tending to go more towards dirt? Well, uh, as some of you might know, I was one of the early adopters of synthetic. I used to try to call them engineered surfaces rather than synthetic because I thought that might be a more palatable uh, form of convincing people that that was a good way to go. But uh, th there's definitely been some resistance uh, at the top training level in, in the U.S. And, and uh, you know, horse racing is a very tradition-oriented sport, and the, the classic American surface is dirt. And, and so there has been some movement uh, from tracks that, that were synthetic surfaces back to dirt, and we're beginning to see some of that. Um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I think one of the great things about the Breeders' Cup is that we offer opportunities for horses to run on both. And we've had Europeans who had never run on dirt come over and be highly successful running on dirt. And uh, I think, you know, a good horse is a good horse. And uh, I think that's one of the great things. These, we have, as somebody said earlier, we're now presenting so many wonderful opportunities for people who invest in horses. And our event was formed as a, an event that was designed to attract buyer interest in, in racehorses and, and encourage the breeding community. And uh, as Rod said earlier, this, I don't view these as competitive events. I think these are all an opportunity for people to go and buy horses, invest in our sport, enjoy the best of it. And uh, whether it's on dirt, synthetic, or turf, they're going to see great horse racing. And I, I think those are all great opportunities. Simon, in uh, Singapore, in the couple of times that I've been there, there have been tropical downpours on both occasions, I think. How much of a challenge does that uh, present the race club to deal with those heavy falls of rain? Well, as you know, we, it rains a lot in Singapore. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we are running on two surfaces. We have the all-weather track, and of course, we're racing on turf. Um, since we moved to the new race course in 99, we, we haven't had a race canceled because of a heavy rain and the track is not taking it well. So it, it, it poses some problem, I suppose, but uh, I, we don't, I, I don't think there's a big issue there. Yeah. Bill? One, one thing I think we all need to consider for, for big events is the, the international pattern, because now we see more and more big events, and Brian mentioned you know, the, the big days in Ireland now, then three weeks to the ARC, and then two weeks to the championships, then there's the Breeders' Cup, and the Japan Cup, and on to Hong Kong. So trying to find the right place um, for the big day, that, that makes sense. In, in the context of the pattern and horses traveling, knowing that they can't dance in every dance, but for us, we're very specific in Hong Kong and very targeted that we bundle up and package four races on one day, all on turf, second Sunday in December where the weather is quite favorable to us and you know, uh, owners and trainers will know that the horses are very likely to run on a good track. So we're fortunate that we have that spot on the calendar locked up. It's been there for quite some time. And then the four races that are the World Turf Championships, we do have dirt racing at Sha Tin. But uh, about 11% of our races in Hong Kong are run on the dirt. But we're very targeted in that on that day when we do bundle up, you know, all four races are on the turf, 1,200, 1,600, 2,000, and 2,400. Yeah. Any more audience questions? I'm having trouble seeing around the corner. Nothing at the moment. We'll move on now to, um, uh, to, to prize money and just how essential it is. Um, Dubai again, the world's richest uh, um, race, and uh, you, I think that the, you're increasing, is it, by another million? Is, is, is that the intention? Uh, the Dubai Duty Free and the Dubai Shima Classic are now both six million up from five million each. And that is in response to what? Why do you, why do you feel the need to go even further? In I just think that... Um, the level of the two races over the last couple of years have, have, have warranted the, um, a, a rise in prize money. Bill said um, <clears throat> yesterday, it might have been the day before, that a, you know, a rise in prize money doesn't necessarily give you a better field, but what it does give you is reward those top class horses that do, um, that do turn up for it. So, um, look, we're, we're very, very lucky in that we have the... the the full, full support of the Mac Toon family in Dubai who, as you know, like, they love their horse racing and, and they, they put so much money into horse racing worldwide. Um, and I mean, the reason that the, the Dubai World Cup was created back in 1996 was to promote Dubai, not only put it on the, the, 
the horse racing map, but to promote it as a tourism and destination <coughs> spot. And, you know, to do that, they, we needed to get, you know, the very best from around the world, and, and I think that's been achieved. Mm. And uh, in, uh, in Sydney, of course, it was absolutely essential, um, but you raised the prize money by about eight times or something, didn't you, beyond? Yeah, I think it was necessary for us to create an awareness of, of the championships and the carnival uh, as, a, as a total. Um, that obviously you know, generated the interest, certainly from uh, our locally based trainers who may have had plans um, maybe not to, to continue within the autumn carnival and prepare for overseas. They certainly, from the day we announced the major prize money, the, the nominations that we received for particular championship days were you know, were, were extensive, uh, well over the you know, 1,200 mark. Some of the races had double nominations they'd ever had in previous years. So it certainly generated that interest and, and created the engagement that we were looking for to ensure that the, the quality horses stayed for the carnival and that they, they came from wherever they wanted to come and, um, and they produced quality fields. And we saw that with the programming and the running of the, the horses that we had week in, week out. Now, Kawara, the, the quality of the horses is so important and building a story around the horses. Deep Impact, Orphore won the feature race by about eight lengths. That created a great deal of excitement. Where do the new stars come from? How, how do you get them? How do you retain them? Um, I'm sure that it's the most uh, difficult problem for the uh, uh, racing circle around the world. Uh, only things that we can do is uh, after the uh, uh, Japanese Derby or uh, Arimakinen, we should promote the horses. You know that the Japanese fans are quite a uh, strong band with the uh, uh, very popular horses. They uh, actually they like to better. Uh, racing, but more that they like the horses themselves. So uh, we need to promote the people to to stick to stick to be tight with the uh, uh, popular horses uh, throughout the year. So this, uh, we should promote by the uh, uh, media, as papers, uh, and some uh, posters, and also the, we we have some. Uh, uh, shops and the goods uh, for the horses, uh, stuffed uh, horses. So the people uh, uh, like uh, like to come to the race course for the uh, to meet the, to see the horses. And also we have the family areas, so the uh, parents and the, uh, their kids are coming to the race, uh, race course. We have a. a like uh, uh, parks on the race courses, so they enjoy the they enjoy the racing, both racing and also the uh, do some uh, family event like the uh, uh, parks, and so that's uh, important uh, things to, for Japan to promote the people uh, to to get a uh, more uh, to get more and more. Or, or favour and deep impact. Yeah, and Karu, Michael talked about uh, turning out in the colours and we've never seen anything like the black caviar phenomena in Australia where yeah. thousands of people would turn out in, in the colours of the horse and of course every major club in Australia competed to get black caviar uh, to the track. Adelaide did, did extremely well off, off, the, off the back of that. Just how, how big was that, the, the black caviar thing in Australia and, and what it did for racing overall? Well, I think uh, what kicks in is the, the patriotic feeling of Australians. I mean, uh, Australians will follow any sport as long as they can uh, find a champion. Mm -hmm. And Black Caviar created that. And it, it's, it's akin to uh, anyone who has a, a race horse in ownership. They want to win their, their, their metropolitan race. They want to have a city win. They, they're happy then to travel to a carnival if their horse is good enough to win a carnival elsewhere. And then if they're actually even better again, they'll travel worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, it's chasing that dream and at the end of the day that's, that's what the, horse, the sport of horse racing is about, is chasing that dream. So, um, and, and the prize money element is helping or assisting that whole infrastructure from a macro sense. 
you need breeders to produce horses and because you never know where that champion comes from and it can be the, the $2,000 horse or it can be the million dollar horse. Um, but yeah, in Australia is one of those uh, situations where a black caviar certainly helps to create that awareness of the sport itself and we need those champions. They just don't stay around long enough. Rod, every country wants a champion to emerge. They do and um, again at, around the same time we were very, very lucky to have Frankel, um, you know, the greatest racehorse in the world. And um, notably, though, it wasn't probably until he got towards double figures that we started to get traction. And we spoke to the connections yeah. of Black Caviar as well, and they said the same. And when she'd won five or six, it was no big deal. It was when it was starting to look very serious that he got traction. So we made the best of that, and we have did lots of marketing around the horse because you really have got to lead with the best. And again, it comes back to people following all sports and wanting to know who the best is. So you have to make the most of your superstars, but you're quite right. Real challenge when promoting flat racing is that our great horses aren't round for long at all. So the window of opportunity is very small. And notably, as Brian said, you know, with, with the, the, the great interest there is in national hunt racing in Ireland and in Britain, national hunt horses are around for longer and you can build up the profile mm -hmm. and you get people turning up to the races wearing their colors and scarves because they've got to know them. Um, on the flat, it is a challenge, but I think we're getting better at it. And there was no better template, despite the fact that we had Frankel, who on ratings was the top, there was no better template for marketing a horse than black caviar. Yeah. Uh, now, I don't want to leave anybody in the audience unable to ask a question if they've got one. Is there last call? Because I now have a question without notice to the whole panel, and I want them to think about this. In the interest of collaboration, around, oh, we've got another one there, but this is, this is quite separate to that. In the interest of collaboration around the world, generosity towards one another, I want you to come up with your favourite race in the world outside of your own country. <laughs> this is an opportunity to give somebody else a break. So, Craig, your favourite race outside of the United States. Uh <clears throat> Well, I'd, I'd have to say the Arc. I mean, I, it's uh, being in Paris in October and uh, enjoying Mr. Romanet's hospitality for over 100 years. Um, is, uh, you know, it's just my, my favorite of all. Bill? Well, I won't say the Arc because Craig's taken that one, and I won't use anything from America because I'll say two countries for me, but I would say um, the Japan Cup, I think the, the atmosphere in Japan on a big race day is sensational, so you can't help but get caught up in that. I, I think, for me, anything in Japan on a big day, a major group one, is pretty exciting. Rod? For me, it would have to be the Melbourne Cup. Um, I love the way that the city owns the race, and from arrival to departure, everyone is talking about it, and that ownership is a powerful thing. I also think commercially, they've put together a, a fantastic set of rights and, and they have various commercial partners all talking to different consumer audiences and of course they have a race that stops a nation so for me beyond of course British Champions Day it would be the Melbourne Cup. Brian. Uh, Craig took my, my selection, I'd go for the arc I must mm. say uh, it's the uh, culmination of the European season uh, and it's a fantastic race it's got a, a great dimension in recent years with the uh, the uh, almost obsession with the Japanese to win it, uh, and I think I, I'd love to be there the year a Japanese horse does win the Ark. Uh, so if you had to nail me uh, to pick one, I'd say the Ark. Okay, Matty? Um, <clears throat> obvious. I mean, I'd have to agree with Rod, the Melbourne Cup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's one of those sporting events, and there's very, very few of them in, in, in any sport anywhere in the world where you can guarantee everyone in that country will be watching it. You know, you've got the Super Bowl in America, but there's very, very few other sporting events. You can guarantee everyone in Australia will watch the Melbourne Cup. There's not too many countries they have school holidays either for a well, race. Yeah. <laughs> Claire? It's Melbourne Cup as well, I'm sorry, sorry to defeat. Um, but for me, the Melbourne Cup, because of the excitement, the carnival feel that's picked up by the crowds, um, that is, it's electric when you're there, it's fantastic. So I would have to agree, Melbourne Cup. Simon? Well, it has to be uh, in Dubai. Not because Claire is sitting next to me. <laughs> um, one of our very own based horse won an international race in Dubai called Rocketman. I think everybody here would have remembered the horse. So that must be uh, something special for us. Mm. Michael? 
It sounds like I have to do the ARC. I haven't been there, so I can't, uh, I can't give it my vote. But for me, I, I think uh, Royal Ascot uh, mm. as a week for me is, um, is my favourite. Mm. Yes, uh, ARC. Yeah. It's uh, every Japanese people uh, look for seeing the uh, Japanese host when we win the ARC the Triumph yeah. in the near future. Yeah. Okay, I always keep an eye on the, uh, the St. Ledger at the Curra as well, I must say. It's a, it's a great lead-up race to the, to the Melbourne Cup, apart from anything else. Well, that uh, brings us uh, to an end of that session. And uh, at 11.20, we'll do uh, Sporting Integrity, Racing as a, as a Front Runner. We've got some especially interesting speakers to contribute to that session. And then, of course, the, uh, the whole of the afternoon is devoted to the big one that might change global racing forever. That is the emergence of racing on mainland China. Thanks very much.